demo. Yeah. yeah, this is a Fazioli. The only one in uh, in, in uh, the south, actually. Isn't that pretty? I did go spray tan this morning. <laughs> Do I look so white? Do I look too white? Uh, let me see what I got here. I'm gonna grab a guitar. You write most of your stuff in the bunker? Well, when I'm, when I'm, yes. fortunate. I've had about 500 of my songs recorded. I've had 42 top 20 singles and 25 of those songs ended up being number ones, which means nobody knows who the f I am. I'm the guy that wrote uh, Try for Pink. You could love a bad name, living on a prayer, living la vida loca. Pontu. Faithfully. Like I'm gonna lose you. Grenade party in the USA. Nobody wants to be lonely. Stay. Mama's broken heart. Decline. A little less conversation. Live like you were dying. Got a little faith in me. Change the world. A thousand years because of you. The river. The whiskey lullaby. What hurts the most? I'm the guy that wrote Jesus Take the Wheel. Well, I should say it this way. I'm one of the three people that wrote Jesus Take the Wheel. We're <laughs> <clears throat> gonna talk first, we're gonna play first. What would you like to do? Let's talk first. Sure, good. Why is Nashville this like bastion of Creativity, mm -hmm. and when it comes to song, I mean, this is right. This is it. Why Nashville? I've often thought a lot about why Nashville. Why is this place this place? You know, most of the real reasons are mysterious as to why this place. But I'm not usually one for these, for the more new agey explanations of there's just a vibe or there's just an energy. <laughs> but there's a vibe, there's an energy. I don't know what that is. But I guess one of the biggest reasons is that the antenna <laughs> that sent out the Grand Ole Opry to far-flung areas all over this country at a time when everybody listened to radio. It was almost like, <laughs> like the bat light into the night saying, you know, come here, this is, this is where this happens. Artists came to Nashville who, once they made it on the Grand Ole Opry, they were in their cars driving from Birmingham to uh, Minneapolis to play a show. So they came back on Friday and Saturday night to perform on the Grand Ole Opry. And when they came back in, those artists who stayed at home in Nashville would greet them at the backstage door, say, hey, I wrote a song, I got a song for you. So an industry was born out of entertainers being out on the road and not having enough time to write songs. And that's how Nashville became this epicenter of songwriting in, in the world. From the corners of the country, from the cities and the farms, with years and years of living tucked up underneath their arms They 
Walk away from everything just to see a dream come true. So God bless the boys who made the noise on 16th Avenue. With a million dollar spirit and an old flat top guitar, they drive to town with all they own in a hundred dollar car. Cause one time someone told them about a friend of a friend they knew who owns you know a studio on 16th Avenue. I just sort of fell in love with this the, the idea that the entire country music industry took place on about four square blocks of this quiet little town and most except for the record companies everything took place in a house that was converted into an office. So much, there's so so much brilliance, so much brilliance in this town that it's just. Uh, that's why people come from all over the world to write here. You know, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I've written with and seen some of the best in the on the planet come to Nashville. They say, well, this is where great songwriters come to write songs. I'm moving to Nashville in two months. Um, I've been in LA for the last 15 years. I've been coming to Nashville for probably five or six years. There's 10 people that I work with all the time in LA, and here I feel like it's a pretty unlimited amount of folks that I can kind of be riding with. Oh, that is ridiculous. It's like a fruitcake. It's densely packed with, with talent. You can go to any one of these buildings, there's probably somebody in there that's a badass. I catch a grenade for ya. So I'm gonna love Damn country music. Thank you, Lord. How could I ask for more? Tell me, baby, do I get one more try? Have a little faith in me. For better or worse. For better or worse. Darling, don't be afraid. I have loved you for a thousand years. Ah, it's all the same thing. Girls chase, boys chase, girls. I can promise you there's a hundred songs being written right now in this town, this very second. And it makes Nashville a very unique place. You go get a pizza, they're gonna have a songwriter's night at the pizza place. This is the only town I've ever known where banks have a stage in the bank. They literally have stages in some of the banks around here. And songwriters will get up. Every waiter that waits on you, every person that valet parks your car, is a world-class gifted musician or songwriter. Kind of what I always tell people is for six months, don't worry about the business. Just worry about becoming a member of the music community and go see how competitive it is here. Go to every writer's night you can go to. Shake the hands of every songwriter you would ever want to meet because they're going to be available to you. They're going to be nice to you because they were in your shoes. Move here. Start living here, start being a citizen here. They take you in, man. I used to friend people on Facebook that I knew were in the music industry, and I would post demos or videos of me at writer's nights or whatever, and um, I would just hope that someone would stumble across it, and someone did. And I went in wanting to learn, but never asking for a record deal or never asking for a publishing deal. I was like, hey, my name's Kelsey, I'm from Knoxville. Um, I'm 15 and I really want you to listen to what I do and tell me how I can be better or tell me who I should be with to make me better. And people took the meetings because they didn't think that I was trying to get anything except for advice. Songwriting may be the only profession I've ever seen where every songwriter genuinely is trying to teach the person it's gonna be their competition. That's something Nashville has that so, f so few industries still have that where you can learn from the masters, where you can sit in a room and the gods of this field will tell you their stories and let you in. I went to my first Writers in the Round uh, at the Bluebird Cafe. 
it was an epiphany. It was religion. It was, I'd never seen anything like it. To be so close to somebody that you can feel their foot in the carpet while they start to sing a song, not only that they wrote maybe 15 years ago, but you've heard on your radio 10,000 times and has become a part of your life. It made me want to be so much better, it made me feel horrible, it made me feel like every song I'd ever written before it was gone, and I'm not using that. It's about what, it's what happens from here on out. I remember trying out for the open mic, and like 90 people tried out, and uh, 30 people made it, and I made it. It's in a little bitty strip mall. It seats 99 people and it launched just about every songwriter career in this town. Artists from Keith Urban to Taylor Swift to Garth Brooks were discovered at the Bluebird. This is a place where dreams come true. Change your life. Oh, it sure changed mine, yeah. It sure changed mine, changed my children's lives. Changed my children's lives that I didn't have yet. The Bluebird Cafe, we help songwriters. I always wanted to get it printed as a bumper sticker, we help songwriters. And uh, it's all about the song. Even more about the song than it was the songwriter, if that can be possible. On my own tombstone, it's just gonna say, shh. Because that's just the shortest way to say, there's something important going on here, shut up and listen to it. It was still turning colder when she made it to the shoulder and that car came to a stop. She cried when she saw that baby in the back seat sleeping like a rock. And for the first time in a long time, she bowed her head to pray. She said, I'm sorry for the way that I've been living my life. I know I've got to change. So from now on tonight, Jesus, take the wheel, take it from my hands, cause I can't do this on my own, I'm letting go, so give me one more chance, and save me from this road I'm on, from this road. Four writers just playing their incredible songs. Some were hits, some were new. It changed my life because I that night I thought, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buckle down and be the best songwriter I know how to be. So I went up and down these streets of Nashville trying to get a publishing deal, a record deal, uh, anything, and I couldn't get arrested. Songwriters spend years, years waiting for that one break. They live on credit cards. They wait to have babies. They, um, because they have to write songs. It took, it took about five years of just nonstop grinding. I would record anywhere, in closet or in the bathroom. One of my funnier, <laughs> I love this. So my mom, this is back the velour days, right? So I had this, she gave me this robe for Christmas. So I had this black velour robe that I'd wear. And I had a little hook on the back of my bathroom door I hung my robe up on, and I'm in my bathroom one day, sitting on the commode, and I started looking, and I could see the door through parts of the robe. And I realized I'd worn the ass out of this robe from sitting down there working in my studio. I'd literally just worn the ass out. And all I could think of was like, the pizza dude must think I'm totally hitting on him when I hit the door. And I turned, you know, to walk back inside, and he's just looking at my ass, just my, my thinly veiled, literally my thinly veiled ass. I was like, <sighs> And then somebody says, okay, you're ready. I'm gonna sign you to a publishing deal and pays him $20,000 a year, which is not enough to live on. Oh gosh, I mean, I've been a bartender, cater waiter, valet. I used to sell pagers. When I first started out, you know, this guy told me, wrote with Bob Dylan, he said, you know, you don't got any mud on you. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you don't got any mud. You've been loved and coddled and you got no mud. You got no rejection. Your mommy and daddy love you, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, you're gonna, you're gonna need to get some mud. They call Nashville a 10 year town, but I, I dropped out of ninth grade and started touring when I was 14 and um, had 10 years before I came to Nashville of like losing record deals, promoters stealing your money on tour. It's a beautiful town. 
it can make all your dreams come true, but it also can be such a bitch of a town. It can be, it can be so hard. You putting your, your heart out on the line daily and getting it smashed because it doesn't sound like the radio or no one will ever record that song because it's too sad or something. And so, this is This Town Is Killing Me. Pour my heart out Three minutes at a time On a J45 And no one's listening They're too busy drinking On the company tab I scream my lungs out Confess my secrets All my sins But they don't give a damn Cause if it don't sound like the radio Steel guitars and broken hearts have done me in. I gave you my soul Cause I wanted it so bad And now I just want to go home This town is killing me This town is killing me It's a no business. You're gonna you're gonna hear no. No as usual. You know, you're gonna write a lot of songs and they're gonna pass on most of them. So you're gonna have to want it bad enough to deal with failure. Because when they finally say yes, it's amazing. There was a turning point where I thought, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have to do something else. Like I'm not gonna be able to support a family like this. And I went to to be the assistant to this big real estate agent. I put a suit on, borrowed a suit, and I was sitting in this big glass lobby, this building, and all these guys kept walking through in their suits with their briefcases, and I just had a panic attack. I just started breathing really hard, I was sweating, and I just realized I was gonna have to do music no matter what, and if I never made money, then I would just continue doing those odd jobs that I'd been doing all those years. And that was two months before I got my first cut. I mean, it, it knocks you down 50 times hoping you won't get back up. And if you do, that's the time it works. It was a title my father had given me. I was calling him about money again. He said, no, you, you're not coming home, John. Don't lose that idea. Don't stop believing. I mean it. Don't stop believing. And I scribbling this thing, and there it is. Just a small town girl Living in a lonely land She took the midnight train Going anywhere I remember, um, I hadn't released any music yet and finally, you know, got to release my first record. And I was at the grocery store, just came out and was standing on the corner with my bags and this car came and pulled up at the stoplight and the windows were rolled down. And she was listening to my song on the radio and singing. And it was the coolest feeling. And <laughs> so I had a friend with me and he was like, you. I'm like, that's me. And he's like, that's her. Telling the girl, that's her. <laughs> and she's driving, she's like. I'm sitting right there when a guy named Tony Arata's on stage one night. He sings these songs, and Tony's a great writer. Garth was sitting right back over there. He was doing construction and selling boots, and I was uh, loading trucks at UPS. It was me, Garth, uh, Liz Hingber, who was a waitress here, and Mark Irwin, who was the bartender. And that was not only who was performing, that was pretty much the crowd. But uh, we each took turns playing songs. And then here comes a song called The Dance. And it was the last song he played. I went up to him. I said, dude, I'm surely that's got to be on hold or something. Somebody's cut that. He goes, no. And it's been here a while. Took it to Alan Reynolds. And Alan Reynolds told me, he said, if you don't cut the dance, it'll be the biggest hit you never had. 
Looking back on the memory of the dance we shared beneath the stars above. And for a moment, all the world was right. But how could I have known that you'd ever say goodbye? And now, glad I didn't know the way it all would end, the way it all would go. Ooh. Our lives, the better left to chance. I could have missed the pain, but I'd have had to miss the. I wrote Stay with a guy named Justin Parker, and he and I were both super broke at the time, met at a coffee shop. I was almost too hungover to, to go. I was nearly going to cancel, and showed up anyway, laid on the couch with like an orange juice and a sandwich, and he started playing these chords, and I said to him, like, well, man, I think I, I, think I have something for that. It's not much of a life you're living, oh, no. It's not just something you take as given. Oh, round and around and around and around we go. Oh, now tell me now, tell me now, tell me now, you know. Yeah, not really sure how to feel about it. Something in the way you move makes me feel like I can't live without you. Yeah, it takes me all the way. And I want you to stay. in a little spaceship and taking the trip, you know. That's what songwriting feels like to me because it's almost like, you know, I'm kind of steering, but not really. Writing a song is, uh, it's like a drug. Um, writing a song is like... Writing a song is like flying. Writing a song is like... Writing a song is like getting beat up. Writing a song is like... Writing a song is, is like having your heart broken over and over and over. Writing a song is like... Writing a song is like your first memory of a birthday party. Songwriting is like therapy. It's like you are writing this great movie that's going on in your mind. And if you get it right, you the rest of the world gets to see the movie in Technicolor. Songwriting is prayer. You know, you open yourself up to receive. And however you do that, whether you do that with a couple of joints and a shot of whiskey, or if you do that by literally getting on your knees and praying for inspiration, that's what prayer is, is opening yourself up to the possibility of something that doesn't exist. As a songwriter, it's like clairvoyance. You have your good days, and you have your bad days, and you have your days that it's almost like you don't even remember feeling it come through your body and, and, and down on paper. So, uh, pretty amazing thing that we get to do. You like that? I like it. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Our little instrumental section. And then, you know what I mean? 
know that? My favorite song is possibly my most successful to date, which would be Try for Pink. You know, people talk about um, you kind of, you're tapping into something and there's something bigger than you kind of vibe, you know? That song was literally, I woke up with that chorus in my head. Like I've never had that. You know, 95% of what you can hear on the radio was literally like, oh, where there is desire, what is this? This is interesting. And I grabbed my phone and recorded it, worked on it for a second. And then I called my buddy Ben later on and said, hey, why don't you come on the Friday and we'll work on that try song. I love this, dude. Should the second verse about be more about her and them? And then that last verse is our current second verse. Are you just getting by? Are you just... You know? Dude. Have you won about what you're doing? Um, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is sick. So it, it was pretty it was pretty amazing when you could see that story of how a song comes to be. It's almost like an act of God, man. <laughs> Stranger you met on a plane. Wrong number. Bring your keys and none of them work. Yesterday's beer. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So I was supposed to make a song out of that. Yeah. Remember. Bring your keys and none of them work. Wrong number. Um, yeah, I don't know where this is going, you know, it would take me, uh, take me a minute. Nothing to say, she's gone away. It just seems like I was trying to paint a picture of a missed connection, basically. Not in the Craigslist way, but, or maybe in the Craigslist way. It's very interesting. Is that the way it is? Like there's all these scraps lying around in your brain or in, in, the, in the universe and you're like... Yeah. I've gotten to the point where my writing has become more, I guess, abstract for lack of a better word. I don't know, it's like approaching it like an abstract painting mm. instead of uh, like with a title or, you know, a hook or something. Like really? That. Yeah, yeah. So I just kind of float around, you know, with my daughter watching over her with the guitar or take her on a walk and recite the lyrics and see what kind of edits itself. So this is very similar. How is it that you put together a song? What's your deal? I wish I knew how to write a song. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm serious. I, I, 
Yeah, I know there's a, there's craftsmen in town who can ride on a dime, and I'm not one of those. I have a habit of playing the guitar every day, and uh, within that habit, I hope that something comes up, but it doesn't always. A lot of younger writers have come up to me over the years, and the only advice I can give is to write songs. You just have to do it. Professional songwriting in Nashville is, is not what people think it is. Most people think songwriters smoke weed and walk around the streets and hope that inspiration hits. Um, that's sort of a good way to be a poor songwriter. Um, you know, you have to treat it like a job. You really do. It, you know, Nashville has a bit of a tradition of that. It started in the 70s. Before then, it was more like that. It was just, let's wait on inspiration. And then a few guys kind of said, you know what? I'm going to keep office hours. In the 1950s and 60s and into the 70s and through the 70s, really, I wrote virtually everything I wrote by myself. I thought you had to go lock yourself in a dark room somewhere, pull down the shades at midnight and sit there till three or four in the morning and see how miserable you could get and write a sad country song. Then I discovered a thing called co-writing. You go in, you write either with a friend uh, that you know well or someone you've never met, and your job is to let your guard down and just be honest with them. I think it's interesting that songwriting is one of the only mediums where you shape things together. like. Nobody starts a painting and then fin and hands it to mm -hmm. someone else to finish. But I love that about songwriting um, because, yeah, I, some of my favorite ideas would never have come along if I didn't have his brain or you know someone else's brain in the room. The most amazing thing about what I do is, you know, Monday through Friday, is I go and I sit in little rooms on Music Row with other songwriters, and I have for 20 years, and we all do life together. I'm like in a bit of a weird mood. I'm like super pumped. <laughs> to be here, I had a big fight with Raleigh, of course, I feel like oh, it always no. feels like this before. <laughs> so I'm like juggling that in my brain. Pain and beauty. And all of it, it's like, I was just an asshole this morning, is basically what it comes down to. <laughs> That's the truth. And so like, trying to deal with that. That's what we do all morning, you know, we're drinking coffee, we're talking about what happened last weekend or last night, and then you start talking about song ideas. <laughs> This line, I don't remember where I heard it, but like a building with rooms I've never explored. Ooh. I think it's beautiful. I got this kind of dumb idea. I like dumb ideas. It's called It Ain't Alive, it's the truth. If it ain't a lie? It ain't a lie. It ain't a lie. If it's the truth. It's just this ping pong process of song idea, song idea, song idea. And then all of a sudden, someone says something that rings a bell. Did you say, baby, you're my lighthouse? Baby, you're my lighthouse. I love stuff like that. I don't know what it is. At the end of the day, we're all making it up. It's just, it is it is truly a mess, and there, it isn't as scientific as you think, and it's like, no, it's not right, no, it's not right, I don't know, more of a milkshake sound. And then suddenly you've got something that's great, you know. Oh, I like that. When I'm lost on a rolling sea. Oh, I'd baby. love to like, so that's kind of like a little bit more like abstract. I'd love to bring it into like some real, real like. It ain't my lighthouse, shining like a sun, silver sun. Baby, you're the only one. I love that. I don't know. The, I like that. I love that. Now, we need a hit chorus and we need two verses. It needs to be simple but it needs to be profound, mm. you know? We need to be brief, you know? But when you start getting into those things, this is a different part of your brain from the, the part of the heart that made you think of the idea in the first place. singing the back half and I think right. that makes it enough and it's like 
Any trouble rolls away. Any trouble rolls away. You know? Yes, yes. <laughs> Do I know if you're gonna like the song? I have no idea. You may not you may not even understand what we're talking about, and I've completely missed the point altogether. But if I can get done and I can look at it and say, I believe this is a hit idea, and I think we wrote it as well as we possibly could have, then I think the song is finished. Okay, I'm gonna play it from the top. I got yesterday's problems settling in my head. And it's so damn loud that I don't even want to get out of bed. But when you lay down next to me, I can see everything clearly. Baby, you're my Anybody who's made a career as a writer will tell you, really, in some ways, it's not even the end product. It's the process that's most important. The best writing rooms to me are when there's three people in the room. And those three people form pretty specific functions. Nowadays, you might have a track guy, you know, and then you've got another lyric guy, you got an idea guy. I need a melody guy. I'm decent at it, but I'd rather have somebody that's great at it. Um, if it's one of the best ideas I've had all year, one thing I do not want to do is write it by myself because it's not going to be a hit. Most everybody in Nashville does not know how to do the whole thing. Okay. The track guy's amazing. The track girl, whoever it is, it's amazing. What they do, I can't do that, but it sounds badass. When you walk in that room and they got something going, it's something going. first before actual lyric but you know Some of it doesn't, but you just kind of blindly go in a direction that just feels right. Is there, is there a recipe to writing a great song? You know, sometimes in anything we do in life, somewhere there's this mentor that you went to and you go back to and you really look up to. And, and mine was a Hall of Fame songwriter named Tom Shapiro. He used to say, there's 5,000 ways to write a song. Pick one. I think that's magic. When I first started coming to town and I was like, I want to write songs, um, I think I met with 30 publishers in town. And so I went around to literally every publishing house with my guitar, played a song. And I remember like how I would write songs at home is I would just pick up my guitar and like whenever I'd kind of feel inspiration. But it was the first time that I saw like a staff songwriter, like these writers would come in with books and they would have titles and titles and like ideas and ideas. And it was like, what is this way of writing? There's one on here called Camp Out Country Titles. <laughs> She's been living in all of her junk, going for the kill, making thrills, crying diamonds. I don't know what those will mean yet, but I'm sure they'll turn into something. Crying and diamonds. <laughs> yeah, come on, come on, come on. Give me some crying diamond action. Uh, I don't know. Who knows? Crying diamonds. 
Uh, uh, now we're like the TV show Nashville. <laughs> like, that doesn't actually happen. That doesn't happen, okay. I've got a notebook full of ideas, and it's, I mean, it's just pages and pages and pages of titles. That's the way I do it, is I, I brainstorm titles as frequently as I can. I don't, I don't think about them when I write them down, and then I go back to them. Is there any way we could photograph that one day? Or? I would give anything for you to be able to do that because it got stolen. It got stolen about four months ago out of my Jeep with my computer. It was in my backpack and I couldn't have given a shit about that computer. But that notebook had 17 years worth of ideas in it. This is a smaller notebook than I used to use, but, um, but I'll fill them up. I'll, I'll have explanations sometimes out in the margin. And it's not necessarily that there's gonna be a great title in there. It's just thoughts and it's phrases that can make me think of it's other fodder. things. You're writing fodder. Exactly. It always starts with words for me. Mm. And I suppose that's because I'm a singer. So I'll overhear something, somebody having a conversation at a table or something in a movie. Well, I'll love a line. I'll think it's so well written and something about it will get in my head. A lot of times I think I write most of my songs in the car just driving. And there's something about the speed of that and everything just flying past so much, which is the exact speed of my brain. It's like, I don't feel like I'm tripping over myself and everything's coming out smooth. I think songwriters think a little differently. You know, you see the world a little differently. You're always going, that's a song, that's a song. That dude and that girl over there, that's a song. I might be in the middle of Thanksgiving dinner. Hear a word, I gotta document it. I'll be in the middle of an argument with someone and think, ooh, they just said a really good line. <laughs> I'll put it down and go, okay, gotta get back to the actual situation. That's the thing is that it, it really is a blessing, man. An idea is a blessing and that's the thing. You never, you don't know where they come from. You don't know why something moves you in a moment. You, your job is not to question that. Your job is to document. Songwriting happens all year round, you know, and it happens everywhere and I just try to be open enough to receive it. All right. Okay. Oh, the story. Okay, the story. The story on the song. Um, it's just. It's a. It's a. It is a country song in itself. So, you know, it's it's just classic. In like three weeks' time, I learned in a week really. Uh, my marriage went south. I lost my record deal and I lost my publishing deal. And as most country singers, I just, you know, figured I could, I could work it out in a bottle of Jack Daniels at some point. And I, I was hanging out at my manager's house, and, and uh, we were sitting up way too late, had way too many, and, and, uh, and he commented that I'd put a bottle to my head and pulled the trigger. And I said, I said, you yeah, that, oh, that's pretty. So I tried to scribble that down, and I lived with that idea for a while. And then that's when I, I brought it to Bill Anderson, you know, my, my hero. Anybody that could come up with a line of, uh, he put the bottle to his head and pulled the trigger is a, is a pretty special human being. I think that's the song that most people will say to me, gosh, I didn't realize you wrote that. She put him out Like the burning end of a midnight cigarette That was my line, by the way. She broke his heart been his whole life trying to forget We watched him drink his pain away A little at a time But he never could get drunk enough To get her off his mind Until the night He put that bottle to his head And pulled the trigger Life is short, but this time it was bigger than the strength he had to get up off his knees. Your first instinct when you hear something like Whiskey Lullaby is not what a commercial masterpiece. It's more like what an artistic masterpiece. It was told in a way that uh, was, a, was a unique take and 
and captured everybody's attention. I mean, it won every award, and it wasn't a new story. You, you need to tell somebody something they already know or something they've already lived through. But the secret is in telling it in a way that they haven't heard. When things started to happen for me, when, the, when my artistry started to take off, was when I started trying to write songs for, I, I always say for the woman who worked at the bank, because when I would go in to write songs every morning, a lot of days I would stop by the bank and I would think about that woman who was the teller and I would think, what's, what's going on in her life? You know, what, what's her story and how do I tell that? Write it to somebody, you know? Don't just write a song like espousing something to someone. You're writing, you're always singing to somebody. When I moved to Nashville, I was dating a girl back in West Virginia. I had been dating her for a couple of years, actually, through college. And two weeks after transferring here, I found out that she had sort of gone to my best friend at home for consolation. <laughs> and I it was devastating. I mean, it was, in some ways, the greatest thing she could have ever done for me. And so I would sit and I would put her photograph on the desk and I would write to her. And I wrote this song and other you to her and got it cut and went to number two on the chart. You're trying to almost sell a house and you, your, your song is like an open house and you bring the listener into the foyer and if he doesn't like what he sees in the foyer, he's gonna walk out. So give them a, a nugget of some truth, of something so they'll continue to listen. And that's what's so good at the Nashville. A lot of the writers here have done the work, you know, in putting the right furniture in their songs. Interesting furniture, interesting decoration. As lonely as these days are long, as dark as a night bird song, a strange way of living has bled my heart dry. Well, I'm lonesome, but too stoned. My clothes, they're ragged and warm Like a sailor who's caught in the worst kind of storm The water keeps rising, but I'm getting by I keep walking, but too stone to fly the end of the day, everybody wants a great lyric, a real lyric, a raw lyric, and that's what Nashville brings, I think, to, to LA and to New York, is we learned from these guys that are twisting hooks, they're painting pictures, they're just, I mean, the Nashville songwriting poets like Chris Christopherson taught us how to write. Take the ribbon from your hair Shake it loose and let it fall. Chris had made such an impact. He was the first writer to really introduce the bedroom to country music. Take the ribbon from your hair, shake it loose, let it fall, lay it soft against my skin like the shadows on the wall. Very poetic stuff, but it was very seductive and it was smart. The great artists like Chris Christopherson or Guy Clark, or Towns Van Zandt, or John Prine. Those are the teachers. Guy Clark and, and I would be writing these songs, and uh, it, it was kind of like being able to hang out and paint with Picasso, you know, for 20-some years. Where melody and poetry meet is where I want to be. That's what I learned from a great artist like Guy Clark. And I go over his house and he say, hey man, if you write a good song, a really good song, people are gonna hear it. End of story. Each time I see you again 
obsessed with Patsy Cline, and one of my first memories of songwriting was when it would say written by Harlan Howard. I was like, well, who is Harlan Howard? A lot of people thought that Harlan Howard, and there's a great argument to be made, is the greatest songwriter that ever, you know, put a pencil to a piece of paper in Nashville. I think if you're not in some way influenced by him, you're missing the boat big time, and you need to go back and listen. Because I just think he did so much with so little. The three chords and the truth. I think that that, that can be overlooked sometimes, but simple is the hardest thing to be. I admire the kind of songwriter that can. That's what um, you know. John Lennon was going for, I think, more and more, was the simplicity, the elegant simplicity of just two or three words, um, two or three chords. I think that's amazing. It's economy. That's what I try to do every day, is boil down a topic. You know, what's the essence of what we're trying to say? He stopped loving her today. You know, so simple. Um, but it says so much, you know, and the feeling is not simple. It's complex and it's timeless. The song may not be your cup of tea, but you will walk out of there going, that was the truth. And that can't be denied. Songwriting for me has to be truth. It has to be true. It has to have some kind of, something that rings true for me. And if it doesn't have that, you know it, especially when you get in front of an audience and, and, and attempt to sing that song, because the audience can tell when you're lying. Harlan's onto something. You, you don't you don't really need anything more than three chords of the truth. Truth being underlined, I tend to I tend to stay more in the five or six chord range myself. For me, it's more like seven chords and the perceived truth. <laughs> well, I don't know but about three chords. <laughs> I may know four or five, and and I know where to buy one of these. But now it's more like four chords. And a pickup. Now it's two chords in a loop. <laughs> but I, I think if if your truth is your truth, the important thing is that you're wearing it on your sleeve and really willing to put it out there for people to hear and disagree with or or agree with. So much of, of songwriting just comes from the, a point of inspiration, and then you just run as fast as you can into the middle of nowhere and try to describe what it is you're seeing or feeling. writing a song with one of my favorite co-writers. I opened up an idea. It was painful, the process of it, because I was really, it was like confessing things that I didn't even want to know about myself. And I came home to Chuck, and I played it for him, and he said, that's the best song you've ever written. And I just cried, and I said, well, if that's what it takes, then I quit. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's the I think it's the the one thing we're obligated to do is is tell it true, and uh, you know, pretty much everything people go through is is universal, and if you tell if you tell it true, it's going to resonate. And truth doesn't always have to be like rock you to your core truth. Like, oh man, that's just, that's some deep stuff right there that really hits me where I live. Sometimes the funniest things are true. I got a call from a legendary a &R guy, John Claudner. John Claudner put me into the room with Joe Perry and Steven Tyler to write a song. The day I got there, they had gone to a bar and it was kind of this kind of very swanky bar and at the very end was this gorgeous blonde and from behind, just curvy and teased up hair. And so they were all drawing straws, trying to figure out who was gonna go up to her. And so suddenly the, the blonde turns around and it's Vince Neil. 
of Motley Crue. And so that's when they all went, oh my God, oh my God, that dick. Life has a funny way of like giving you signs before they happen. I was in a studio in New York um, late at night. I snuck into the studio. A friend of mine was the engineer. So I would go in there late at night to get my demos out. And um, I was in the hallway just kind of hanging out. And then I looked up and these two bodyguards came in with Britney Spears. And she walked by and I said to myself, I'm gonna work with her one day. I don't know how, but I'm gonna work with her one day. We, we kind of like to leave the, the biggies for the last. So we got Brittany up here, Celine up here, Bruno, Neo, Cher and, and Christina Aguilera, Whitney Houston, and Michael Jackson. Yeah, so this is like this is like royalty lane right here, whatever you want to call it. So I think I had to convince myself I was a songwriter before anyone else said you're a songwriter. When did you go, wow, uh, I've arrived? When Elvis cuts one of your songs, I mean, in my in my instance, that was it. I mean, uh, there was uh, no getting around it. I mean, he was the man, and uh, I had some of the first songs I wrote. I, I wrote with him in mind. You know, I saw him on the back of a flatbed truck at the Hub Motor Company parking lot. You know, all the girls went crazy, and I thought to myself, boy, if I can't do that, I'm gonna get a song to him if nothing else. As the snow flies On a cold and gray Chicago morning A poor little baby child is born in a ghetto And his mama cries Cause if there's one thing she don't need It's another little hungry mouth to feed in the ghetto for me, I like to have an artist in mind when I write a song, because I try to kind of put my voice into that artist's voice. Um, and that artist could be a male or a female. Pink, she's a massive artist. Her recording your song is this, you know, it affected us greatly. Um, and she said something, she said, L.A. Reid always told me, um, smart artists will cut a song even if they didn't write it. And it was like, wow. Hey, we get these pitch sheets. The publishing companies get these sheets no kidding, from, from the record company. And it'll give everybody on their label that's looking for songs to record. So you go down and you kind of see, and you, that helps you go, hey man, I've got a song I just wrote last week that's perfect for what they're looking for. And then you send it over and see if they hear it and they, it ends up on the record. And interestingly enough, sometimes you write a song that you were writing for that, it didn't work for them, but a year later it ends up on someone else's record. I, biggest song that we had together was Change the World. It got pitched out of Polygram Music Publishing Company and Don Potter took it from there for Winona Judd's next project. We were told that it was gonna be a single for her and all this stuff. And then we watched them put out one, then two, then three singles from that record and none of them were this song. And so we were sort of like, wow. Uh, about the time we were digesting the fact that we were not gonna have a song out as a single with her, Clapton, puts it out in the soundtrack the summer of 96 in the movie Phenomenon. If I could be king Even for a day I'd take you as my queen I'd have it no other way
the vast majority of songs that have come from professional songwriters that they said, I don't know where this came from, or I was driving down the road one day and I saw this thing and I had to write about this. I had to walk into this room and tell you the story and write about it. And then there's that whole other side where, you know, you, you get a list of things that a certain artist is looking for and you need to write about these specific things. But I've been in many rooms where you may have that list of directives, but the room and the energy in the room takes you somewhere else. And that ends up being the thing that gets cut. Wow. Yeah. Really? Um, can you, can, can you give me like an example of that, like in your own, like where that happened to you? Um, yeah, well, yes. Um, it was summer day, 16th Avenue, and it was in, in a house on the row. Went up to the attic to write with Katie Herzig. And we'd been given a set of directos, you know, different, different artists who were looking for things in a, in a specific lane to write in. I didn't want to write anything. And I'm sitting there with my head back on the couch and Katie starts playing these really open chords and she's only hitting two strings every time, sliding up and down. And, and I just pictured in my, in, in my head this image of a man on the street who was also having a really bad day, but worse than I was having. Didn't have a home to go to, didn't have a car to get in after all was said and done. And the lyrics flowed really quickly, and in 20 minutes in, we had this song that was nothing like the directives. But that was the only song of mine that has ever gotten Grammy recognition. But I never had the time I never had the luxury Life's hard I've always known that I've never been handed no welcome mat When I die, please don't cry Cause heaven's my home anyhow mm -hmm. Anytime I do a song it feels magical. It may not always get to the place that I think it should get to, mm -hmm. but those ones always find a home. One of my good friends was Bob Beckham, and he wrote, he, he ran uh, Combine Music. And uh, Bob called me and said, I got this new writer kid in town named Chris Christopherson, and he's written three songs. You come listen, I want you to record. Pick any one you want. So I said, okay. So I went over and he played me, helped me make it through the night, Sunday morning coming down, and I think for the good time. And uh, I said, well, I sure love that Sunday morning coming down. I'll cut that. I put out Sunday morning coming down. <laughs> Sold 12. <laughs> Johnny Cash cut it a couple years later, and it was a big hit for Johnny Cash. And I finally figured out. I didn't have the image to sell a song about being stoned on Sunday morning. I just, my image is just too clean, you know? If a song is a hit, it's a hit. I just wasn't the right one to sell it. Well, I woke up Sunday morning with no way to hold my head that didn't hurt. And the beer I had for breakfast wasn't bad, so I had one more for dessert. You know, when, when a song is song of the year or, or, or just a massive hit, impacting hit, it's, it, there's a reason for that. Something speaks to people. Like what hurts the most, you know, a real song again about, uh, that was about my father and, and, um, and, and the time that he had left in his life when, when he had sent me out to go, go do your music, man. And I didn't get to see him for the, near the end, till the very end. And you know, all that time, God was like, man, I could have been here, I could have been here. And he, 
He wanted me out there. You know, he, he knew, you know, I didn't know, but he knew. And so that's what that song was about. And then it ends up being this massive love song that, that strikes a chord throughout the world. And then, you know, then I lost my son 10 years ago and that song became a whole new song for me. I can take the rain on the roof of this empty house. That don't bother me. I can take a few tears now and then and just let them out. I'm not afraid to cry every once in a while. Even though going on with you gone still upsets me. There are days every now and again I pretend I'm okay. But that's not what gets me. What hurts the most is being so close and having so much to say and watching you walk away and never knowing what could have been and not seeing that love in you is what I was trying to do. You just never know when you you sit down and put some words on paper and give it a melody. You don't know where the thing is going to fly off to and who it's going to touch. I had a man tell me that he was in his car driving out in the swamps of Louisiana, listening to the radio. He said, I was going to commit suicide. And he said, your song came on the air about five little fingers. It's about your daughter. And he said, I realized that I really had more to live for than I thought I did. I pulled over to the side of the road. I listened to your song. I turned the car around and I went home. That's when being a songwriter is special. I mean, it's just one of those weird things where you never know in my world what day is gonna be a day that's gonna change your life or change other people's lives, you know? I show up at this building pretty much every day and I sit in a room this big and that particular day, I remember not even really wanting to go to work, which is unlike me, but I thought, you know, Connie Harrington, she, I saw her on my calendar, and, and I thought, you know, worst case scenario, we'll go have lunch, it'll be fine. So Connie had just pieces of paper and post-it notes, and she's always shuffling through all these ideas. She came to this one, and she started to cry. And I was like, what's that? I was... driving home, and I listen to talk radio, NPR radio, regularly. And then this man comes on. He was trying to petition to get the right to put flags on the graves of not just his son's grave, whom he lost in Afghanistan, but all the soldiers in that particular cemetery. And they asked him, how did he cope? with losing his son. And he said, I drive his truck. And he said, it burns, you know, gas like crazy. We drive it anyway, you know, mm. because he felt closest to him. She literally was crying so hard that she could not even tell me the title. She just, she would get the story started and then break down. And I'm driving, you know, and I've got, I keep little yellow post-it notes and I'm writing down the details of this truck and sticking them on my dash, trying not to wreck. And uh, I thought that deserves to be written about. I mean, we have literally just cried our way through about four hours of just imagery, writing words on a page. I felt so strong that I had to treat this idea with kid gloves because I knew that there hadn't been a lot of songs written about grief. But we both agreed at the end of the day it would be good to get a guy's perspective on it, you know. So we debated who that should be and uh, arrived at uh, Jimmy Eerie. There's, you know, eight male songwriters just in this building we could have called. And if we had called any of the other ones, it wouldn't be I Drive Your Truck that, that we have today. And so we booked another writing appointment and he came in and me and him got the guitars out. He had kind of a a melody going, it was perfect. When I write, when I get so far and I realize today's going well enough, this is gonna be a real song. I will type in the date 
and I will type in the title. And when I did that, I just stopped, burst into tears, and they were like, what's wrong? I'm like, we wrote that song on June 21st. When I zoomed in on the picture of Jared C. Monty's grave, he was killed June 21st. The second she said it, I got a chill up my body because I knew this, this is important. We've got to get this in the right hands and the right artist. And Lee Bryce took it all the way to number one, which was unbelievable. The all along though, we're fantasizing, thinking, has that dad heard it? The, this guy that said it on the interview, is it possible that he's a country music fan that he would hear this song? Last time I talked to my son, the phone rang. Hi, Pop, how you doing? Happy Father's Day. And he was on a satellite phone in Afghanistan talking to me. And we talked for a while, and then he said, Pop, I got to go. We're going on a mission. That was on June 18th, 2006. And he left for the mission, and three days later, I had men walking up my driveway to tell me he had been killed. Yeah, that's the, that's the Medal of Honor. How, how did it make you feel when you heard that song for the first time? Sad, tearful. It, it was very difficult to listen to. I mean, I only got, I think I only got part way through the song, I had to shut it off. And it's still pretty much that way. I still don't get to get all the way through. Have your, kid, have your other kids heard the song? Oh yeah. Both my daughter and my son are so hurt by their brother's death that they've reacted in... Like crazy, that's for sure. Oh, but I don't mind. 
People got their ways of coping Yeah, I got mine I drive your truck Roll every window down And I burn up Every back road in this town Find a field and tear it up Till all the pain's a cloud of dust Yes, yeah, sometimes I drive your truck I leave that radio playing The same old country station Where you left it Yeah, man, I crank it up Probably punch my arm right now If you could see this tear rolling down my face Well, man, I'm trying to be tough Yeah, Mama asked me this morning If I'd been by your grave But that flag and stone ain't where I feel you anyway I drive you a truck Tear it up till all the pain's a cloud of dust. Yes, sometimes I drive your truck. Ooh. Well, I've cussed, I've prayed, I've said goodbye, I've shook my fist, asked God. Drive your truck, roll every window down, <clears throat> burn up. Every back road in this town, find a field, tear it up till all the pain's a cloud of dust. Sometimes, Jared, sometimes I drive you. Everybody's creative in some way. Some people cook, some people paint, some people dance. That's the connecting piece. We all have that. We all have that. We don't all acknowledge it, but we all have it. And that's what songwriting is. It's being able to see art in life, but interpret that in words. For some people, it'll be with brushes. For us, it's words and music. At the end of the day, we're all the same guy. We're staring at an empty page. 
and we're sitting with a guitar and we're just trying to mean something that means something to somebody else. We're more connected than we all think. And in this world right now, I think people are longing to feel like we're all connected, you know? So, I mean, uh, I think songwriting is more important than it's ever been. You know, music's one of the only things that I know of in the world that can turn bad into good. Whatever is the worst thing that ever happened to you can become a, a, a song that'll make your life better and a song that'll improve the life of anybody that hears it who, who has a, a shared common experience or even a sad song can be good for all kinds of people. There's not many things that turn bad into good and I get to be connected to one of them. Classic songwriters, their songs will be around a lot longer than you or I. And, um, and it's because they're good. <laughs> you know, it's that simple. If you listen to Top 40 Music today, how many of those songs are gonna be around in 50 years from now? And I think the answer is probably very few. And I feel like I listen to the best songs that come out of Nashville are the songs that I think we'll be singing 100 years from now. This, this is a songwriting town, period. Everything else is in the next paragraph. These people are geniuses. And so I'm proud to be from Nashville because there are more kinds of music here, more people doing it on a real high professional level than anywhere in the world. There are times when I could probably make a little bit more money doing something else, but um, I just wouldn't be happy doing something else. And I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> I don't think you write with this uh, false hope that you're gonna make it big, you're gonna make it rich. I think you write because that's what you do, that's what you are. This is better than a royalty check, right? This moment right here is bigger, better in the grand scheme of things. This, is, this means more than, than that because it's a memory. We made a memory. Instead of money, we made memory. A song has the power to soothe your soul. It has the power to speak the words that you don't know how to speak. It has the power to give you hope that you didn't have. And I'm ever amazed. There's, t what, 12 notes, 26 letters. And I'm ever amazed because it, it never fails that I'll turn on the radio and go, <sighs> you know I mean? It's like that idea is so good and so obvious and done so well. I mean, you would think we'd run out of things like that, but not in this town. People say like, well, is it any harder than it was 20 years ago in Nashville? Is it? Like, yeah, look, it's, I just tell you, it's always been impossible. It's always never gonna happen. It's always nothing but catch 20 things. It's always just screwed up and it's never gonna happen. And every week, there are number one parties for kids, first number one parties for kids. Go to a bar and with your friends and drink a beer with no music going. You know, just think of all the things that very rarely you do that you don't hear music. And everybody forgets that it started with a songwriter. It started with somebody that got up and went in a room and had the nerve to put their journal to music. It's just crazy that it's an industry, an industry where you go to work having no idea what you're gonna actually produce and you're gonna take an idea that's floating around in your head and put it on paper and make it you know, actually concrete, which turns into hopefully a song, which turns into a demo, which turns into maybe hopefully a record cut, which then people all over the world hear. It's like, what? How is that even a job? To go from, there's a song I wrote that my publisher walked into the room and said, that's a hit. Then five months later, Rihanna wants to cut it. Then I think six months later, the first time it's being performed is at the Grammys, and I'm on stage with her. There's a, there is a kind of a, a funny little story that goes around amongst songwriters that the, the greatest three songs ever written in the history of songwriting are Amazing Grace, Bridge Over Troubled Water, and Whatever I Just Finished Writing. <laughs> my, one of my favorite quotes is by Quincy Jones, and he said, you need three things to make a great record. Three things. The song, the song, and the song. <laughs> the reason I do this 
is is that I'm chasing a feeling. I'm chasing the chills. It's the best drug, you know, besides love. It's the best drug I can think of. The beauty of my job is that I have no idea. I've been doing it for 22 years. I had 21 number one songs, and I have no idea what makes a great song. They come from poets and balladeers, age-old stories passed down through the years, from a little baby's laughter, from lover's tears, and sometimes God just whispers in your ear. What would remind you? 